In the deepest corners of ancient Palestine, amid the shadows of mystery and echoes of legends, rises the colossal figure of a man who defied the limits of human strength, Samson, the titan among mortals. His story, a symphony of wonders and misfortunes, unfolds like a tapestry woven with threads of mystery, passion and redemption. Welcome to the audiobook The Story of Samson, the strongest man in the world, where each word is a portal to a forgotten time, where the light of the divine and the shadow of the human intertwine in an eternal dance. From his mysterious birth to feats that defy reason, join us on a fascinating journey through sacred tales. In these auditory pages, we will unravel ancient secrets, explore the complexities of strength and weakness, and immerse ourselves in the enigmatic life of one whose fate was intertwined with the supernatural. With every whispered word, I will invite you to unearth the truth behind the myth, to discover the essence of the man who rose as a giant among mortals. Let the whisper of history envelop you as we explore the mysterious twists of fate that took Samson from the heights of strength to the depths of darkness. Is strength a divine gift or an unbearable burden? Can redemption find its way even in the heart of darkness? Go ahead, curious listeners, let the story of Samson cast its spell on you, where each chapter is a door to the unknown. My name is Samson, and I want to share my story with you, even though at this moment I find myself imprisoned in a Philistine jail, blinded and bound by my enemies. However, my life was not always like this. Let me take you through the ups and downs that marked my existence. My tale is a complex mix of triumphs and tragedies, fierce battles, and personal struggles that have left an indelible mark on my being. My era is defined by Philistine dominance in the land of my people, where the fate of a nation rests on my shoulders. The Israelites, in a moment of disobedience to the Lord, were handed over to the Philistines, who oppressed our people for an endless forty years. The Philistines, known as an aggressive people, inhabiting the land southwest of Israel, between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River, were called the Sea Peoples due to their prominent maritime history. Their civilization stood inland from the Canaanite coast, ruled by tyrants, and they became mortal enemies to me and my people. Moreover, their innovative use of iron in weapons surpassed the bronze technology used by the Israelites, constantly hindering the progress of my people. Despite overwhelming challenges, my story is not limited to battles against the Philistines, but also encompasses the complexities of my personal life. My relationship with God, my choices and personal challenges, have left an indelible mark on my existence. As I face the darkness of my present imprisonment, I reflect on moments of triumph and decisions that led me to this fate. My story originates from a mysterious birth that marked the destiny of my people. My father, Manoah, from the tribe of Dan, resided in the city of Zorah. My mother, initially unable to conceive, experienced the astonishing encounter with the angel of the Lord, whose visit heralded the blessing of a son who would change the course of history. This divine message included the warning that my mother should abstain from wine, alcoholic beverages and forbidden foods during her pregnancy, as the son about to be born, namely me, would be dedicated to God as a Nazirite from the moment of his birth and would be chosen to liberate Israel from Philistine oppression. The angel of the Lord, appearing as a man but with an angelic countenance, urged my mother to take special care of me with a focus on the Nazarite vows that would be imposed on my life. These sacred vows included keeping my hair uncut, abstaining from wine and grape products, as well as avoiding contact with the dead. This divine commitment, imposed from the maternal womb, was also shared by my mother during the time she carried me, thus sealing our destiny in dedicated service to God. This prophecy and sacred commitment forged the beginning of my life with a divine purpose, paving the way for the extraordinary events that were to come. Every detail of my existence was intertwined with a higher purpose and a destiny that would unfold as my story unfolded, before the eyes of those who would witness the Lord's work through my life. The birth of a child, especially in those times, was a cause for great celebration. It not only meant the continuation of the family lineage, but also foreshadowed leadership in the home, the community, and even beyond the borders of Israel. 
My arrival in the world was met with joy and gratitude towards God, as it was expected to carry the promise of a prosperous and purposeful future. As I grew, my father, eager to gain more clarity about my destiny, turned to prayer, and the Lord, through the angel of God, appeared again to my mother while she was working in the field. My father, seeking a manual of instructions to guide my life, requested additional details on how I should govern my existence and contribute to the divine plan. In response, the angel of the Lord provided clear guidelines, urging my mother to strictly follow the given instructions. She was prohibited from consuming grapes, raisins, or any product derived from the vine, as well as ingesting wine or other alcoholic beverages. Furthermore, she was required to separate herself and dedicate her life entirely to God. Although my father longed for more details about my destiny, the angel of the Lord, in divine wisdom, did not reveal additional information but reaffirmed the importance of obeying what had already been communicated by God. Thus my childhood was marked by these divine instructions, laying the groundwork for a life that would be guided by a higher purpose. Every detail, from my conception to my upbringing, was imbued with a divine meaning that would only fully unfold over time. This astonishing event marked a turning point in my family's perception of divinity. The ascent of the angel of the Lord in the flame of sacrifice towards the heavens was an awe-inspiring spectacle that left my father trembling in fear for his own life and that of my mother. The thought of having seen God filled him with anxiety, believing that such an encounter could result in death. In contrast, my mother embraced a more optimistic and spiritual perspective. Contemplating the divine act, she discerned that if the Lord had desired to end their lives, he would not have accepted the burnt and grain offerings or revealed so many revealing truths. For her, God's past intervention in their lives served as a tangible promise of his constant care and the future blessings that were to come. This episode not only strengthened my mother's faith, but also left a lasting impression on my family, reminding us that divine signs should not always be interpreted as negative omens. Instead, they are reminders of God's continuous guidance and protection in our lives. From this moment, my family began to view our lives as part of a larger divine plan, full of mysteries and purposes that would be revealed over time. My mother's unwavering faith in divine promises was a constant light for my father, who, despite his initial fears, found in her a pillar of spiritual strength. Instead of criticizing or questioning, my mother became an invaluable source of encouragement. Holding on to the belief that the prophecy would be fulfilled according to the divine plan. The long-awaited day finally arrived, and I was born amid celebration and joy. Following an ancient tradition in Israel, my mother made the decision to give me my name. Thus, I was called Samson, a significant choice that not only resonated with being the youngest son, but also carried with it the hope and strength my mother desired for my life. The choice of the name was not merely a symbolic act, but a recognition of the intrinsic connection between my identity and the purpose God had for me. In each syllable of Samson, the plot of a story destined to unfold with unexpected twists and turns was woven. My mother's choice of my name became an anchor of meaning, reminding us all that even in the midst of uncertainty, we were immersed in the divine fabric of history. The strength that the Lord had instilled in me from birth manifested in an extraordinary way, and during my childhood, hints of a divine purpose were already evident. However, like every human being, I found myself facing the temptations and challenges inherent in the world around me. A significant turning point in my story occurred when during a visit to Timnah, I was captivated by the beauty of a Philistine woman. Despite objections from my parents and clear warnings about the risks associated with marriages between Israelites and Philistines, I was driven by a passionate desire to marry her. My stubbornness in the face of warnings and established norms reveals the vulnerability of my heart to earthly passions. Although I possessed exceptional physical strength, my will was subject to the same temptations that affect any human being. This episode marked a moment where my determination clashed with expectations and traditions, triggering a series of events that would transform my life in unpredictable ways. While arranged marriages were the norm at that time, my desire to marry a woman from another tribe 
especially a Philistine, created tensions and challenges in my life. Despite the wise warnings and legitimate concerns expressed by my parents, I decided to follow my passionate desire, defying social norms and community traditions. My parents, initially hesitant and aware of the potential consequences, could not contain my determination. Ignoring objections and challenging societal expectations, I managed to persuade them, and together, our family embarked on the journey to Timna in search of the woman who had captured my heart. This period marked the beginning of a challenging journey, where my determination clashed with the social conventions of the time. Despite risks and tensions, my persistence revealed a tenacity that, while driven by desire, also foreshadowed the strength of character that would later define my role in the history of Israel. As I journeyed along the path to the vineyards of Timna, a unique and significant place due to the Nazarite prohibition of contact with grape products, I faced a surprising challenge. A young lion, fierce and threatening, pounced on me in an unexpected moment. It was then that I experienced the direct intervention of the Spirit of the Lord, descending mightily upon me, infusing me with supernatural strength. At that crucial moment my hands, strengthened by divine inspiration, became an instrument to overcome the lion. With tenacity and courage, I tore apart the jaws of the fierce predator, thus demonstrating the special connection between my life and divine intervention. This encounter not only affirmed my unique physical ability, but also signaled the continuous presence of the Lord in my life, guiding me even in moments of danger and challenge. This incident marked a milestone in my journey, shaping the course of events that would follow in my path. The experience with the lion, although Asian lions were common in the fertile region, became a unique and symbolic chapter in my life. Beyond the usual presence of these majestic animals, the encounter with the lion was not merely a physical confrontation, but a representation of the chaos and untamed nature of the world in all its manifestations. Although at first glance the lion appeared more like a young goat to me, its presence left an indelible mark on my memory. I chose to keep silent about this event upon returning home, not sharing the extraordinary experience with either my father or my mother. Our mission, which had led us to that place, required our full concentration and dedication. In hindsight, that encounter with the lion became a symbol in my journey, reminding me of the complexity and challenges of the world around me. The decision to keep this episode a secret marked the beginning of a series of events that would shape my destiny in unexpected and fascinating ways. As I progressed towards Timna and engaged in conversation with a woman I had met, a sense of satisfaction filled my being. Everything seemed to unfold smoothly, and with the certainty that I would soon return for my future wife, I continued my journey. However, destiny led me back to the place where I had faced the lion, and upon examining the carcass, I discovered an unexpected surprise. In astonishment, I noticed that a swarm of bees had transformed the lion's body into a honey deposit. I saw this as a divine reward for the victory I had experienced earlier. Carefully, I collected the honey in my hands, and in a gesture of gratitude, tasted it as a reminder of the strength I had demonstrated. In an impulse of generosity, I shared part of the honey with my father and mother, without revealing the peculiar origin of this delicacy, as my Nazarite vow prohibited any contact with a dead body. This episode became an intriguing chapter in my story, where the unexpected intertwined with the celebration of victory and the lesson of maintaining the integrity of my sacred vow. Every experience on my journey seemed woven with a thread of the divine, marking my destiny with mysteries and challenges. Wedding preparations continued as my father finalized arrangements, and to celebrate the upcoming union, I organized a feast in Timna. This event, spanning seven days, followed the tradition of elite youth. It was days of pure celebration, with feasts, drinks, and joy culminating in the eagerly anticipated consummation of the marriage. Amidst the excitement of the celebration, the gravity of the situation intensified for me. My Nazirite commitment, with its strict restrictions, stood in the way of my ability to enjoy grape-derived products. The delights and festivities characterizing the wedding were tinged with the constant awareness of my sacred vow. Despite the restrictions imposed by my Nazarite vow, 
the festivities continued in Timna. The city plunged into days of rejoicing, celebrating not only love and marital union, but also my central role as a prominent figure in the celebration. The duality between shared joy and personal restrictions highlighted the complexity of my role in those festive days. The wedding, officially marked by the family's agreement on the dowry and bride's price, was in full swing. The union would be consummated, and the betrothed would become husband and wife. During these moments of joy, I decided to add an intriguing twist to the celebration. I selected 30 young men from the city and presented them with a challenging riddle. My offer was generous. If they could solve with the puzzle, I would provide them with tunics and festive attire. Otherwise, it would be they who would surrender them to me. However, after three days without reaching a solution, impatience began to surface. On the fourth day, the threat to set fire to my father-in-law's house hung in the air as the young men insisted on obtaining the answer. The festive atmosphere was momentarily marred by tension, and the resolution of the riddle became a more pressing matter. This episode, though unusual amid wedding celebrations, added a touch of drama to my story, marking a moment of challenge and confrontation in an environment that was supposed to be purely joyful. My wife, engulfed in distress, pleaded with me to reveal the answer to the riddle. Despite her entreaties, I stood firm in my decision not to share the secret, maintaining the same reluctance I had kept with my father and mother. The mystery persisted, and to heighten the anticipation even more, I decided to keep the town's youth in suspense until the last day of the celebration. Finally, the climactic moment arrived. On the seventh day, amid growing anticipation, I decided to reveal the answer to the riddle that had intrigued the city's youth so much. With a smile on my lips, I said, From the eater came something to eat, from the strong came something sweet. The answer was undoubtedly honey. Before the sun set, the young men presented their own attempt to solve the riddle. What is sweeter than honey and stronger than a lion? It was a moment of relief and celebration, and the participants could finally enjoy the tunics and festive attire I had promised them. This episode added a touch of intrigue and suspense to the festivities, transforming them into a memorable experience for all present. The betrayal of my wife, who allied with her people against me, caused deep pain in my heart. My response, filled with anger, reflected my frustration, pointing out that her intervention had facilitated the resolution of the riddle. Although I kept my word and granted tunics and festive attire to the young men who eventually solved the riddle, the flame of my anger still burned within me. I decided to head to the city of Ashkelon for release, where, with relentless force, I eliminated thirty men and confiscated their possessions. The defeated men's tunics and clothes were given to those who had triumphed in the test, but resentment persisted as a shadow over my soul. This episode marked a dark turn in my relationship with the Philistines, leaving a trace of conflict and bitterness. The decision to retaliate and seek revenge revealed my impulsive nature and the difficulty I experienced in letting go of grievances. Although the town's young men received their reward, my heart continued to harbour the wound of betrayal and the loss of trust in those I once considered close. The return home marked a return to routine and family life, but tragedy was about to unfold in my life. During the quiet wheat harvest season, I decided to make a romantic gesture and took a young goat as a gift for my wife. I joyfully announced my intention to spend the night with her, but reality struck with surprise when her father barred my entry. My wife, in an unexpected turn, was given to my companion, who had also been my best man at the wedding. Although I won the battle for the young goat, I lost the war for my marriage. My wife left with another man. The cruel justification from her father echoed in my ears. I thought you hated her. My fate took an even more bitter turn when I was forced to marry my best man instead of the woman I loved. In a bewildering act, the father suggested that his younger sister, even more beautiful, could fill the void in my marital life. My heart burned with anger at this proposal, and the sense of loss overwhelmed me. My revenge against the Philistines was carried out meticulously and strategically. I decided that this time, the guilt would not rest solely on my shoulders. My anger became an unleashed force upon their people, 
a response to the injustices I had suffered. It was in the midst of the wheat harvest when calm prevailed that I planned my act of retaliation. I embarked on an apparently impossible task, gathering and controlling 300 foxes. I showcased my prowess as a master of beasts, first by effortlessly defeating a lion and then by manipulating these cunning animals. I tied the tails of the foxes in pairs and attached a torch to each pair of tails, creating an unstoppable formation. The night was illuminated by the glow of the torches as the foxes ran uncontrollably through the Philistine wheat fields. The fire devoured everything in its path, consuming not only the grain, but also the sheep and the unharvested crop. My flames of revenge knew no bounds, spreading to the vineyards and olive groves, leaving a trail of destruction in my wake. The Philistines, bewildered, wondered who could have carried out such an act. The answer, laden with fury and desperation, pointed directly at me. When the Philistines found out they asked who did this, the answer was Samson. They explained that due to the actions of my father in law I had destroyed their fields, so the Philistines took my wife and her father and executed them. When I discovered what had happened, I made a vow of vengeance. I was in a complete spiral of anger. First, I was deceived. Then my wife married another, and otherwise, she was executed. My response was a fierce retaliation against the Philistines, and to carry out this endeavor, I established a strategic camp in the region of Judah, dangerously close to the city of Lehi. My presence in the area stirred great agitation and concern among the men of Judah, who, bewildered and fearful, wondered why the Philistines were attacking them in this manner. The Philistines' cruel declaration echoed in the ears of the inhabitants of Judah. We have come to capture Samson. We have come to avenge what he did to us. This statement caused a sense of anxiety and bewilderment among the local population, who, without knowing the precise details, understood that my name was associated with the anger and retaliation of the Philistines. The atmosphere in Judah became even more tense as the shadow of revenge darkened the land, and uncertainty gripped the region. In response to the call of 3,000 men from Judah, I descended from my camp in the cave to face their questions and concerns. Confronting them, they exclaimed urgently, Don't you realize that the Philistines are ruling over us? What are you doing? Their voices reflected the fear and dismay that had taken hold of the region due to Philistine pressure. However, my response was firm and direct. I only did to them what they did to me. I tried to explain that my actions were a just response to the injustices I had suffered at the hands of the Philistines. However, the men of Judah didn't entirely share my perspective and, concerned about Philistine reprisals, expressed their intention to bind me and hand me over to my enemies. Despite the tension in the air, I accepted the proposal of the men of Judah, on the condition that they promised not to take my life, recognizing that, despite my strength, I was not invulnerable, I sought a guarantee of survival. The men of Judah responded affirmatively, assuring that they would only bind me and hand me over to the Philistines, without causing me mortal harm. This pact marked a turning point in my story, as I prepared to face my destiny, hoping that my strength could be used for the benefit of my people. The episode of my delivery to the Philistines by the soldiers of the tribe of Judah reveals the depth of the oppression my people suffered at the hands of these tyrants. The irony that my own countrymen would prefer to please their oppressors rather than support me is a painful reminder of the difficult situation we were in. Although I submitted to being bound with two new ropes, this apparent surrender only set the stage for the unfolding of a supernatural act. The journey from the rock to Lehi was a triumphant procession for the Philistines, who advanced victorious and exultant for having captured their formidable enemy. However, when we arrived at Lehi, something extraordinary happened. The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon me, and the ropes that bound me unraveled from my arms as if they were strands worn by fire, falling useless at my wrists. At that moment, my gaze fell upon the jawbone of a freshly deceased donkey lying nearby. I lifted it, wielding it as an improvised weapon. With a strength that could only come from divine intervention, I faced the Philistines. In a feat that astonished both friends and foes, 
I defeated a thousand enemies with the jawbone of the donkey. I became an army of one, showing that even in apparent defeat, the strength of the Lord can prevail in unimaginable ways. My time as a judge was a unique stage in the history of Israel. My proclamation of killing a thousand men with the jawbone of the donkey became part of the legend, and the place where I threw the jawbone was baptized as the Hill of the Jawbone, a monument bearing witness to divine intervention. The title of judge attributed to me does not fully reflect the essence of my task. In Hebrew, the word translates to problem solver, a role that encompassed much more than a simple legal ruling. My duty was to guide the people of God in tumultuous times, a monumental task given the ongoing Philistine oppression. For two decades, I served as a judge, facing the challenges and conflicts of the nation of Israel. However, despite my efforts, the Philistines still maintained their dominion over the land. My leadership, though notable, was not enough to completely free my people from foreign oppression. My actions, both in the battle with the lion and on the hill of the jawbone, became highlights in my life, but darker times were looming. My personal choices and weaknesses began to emerge, marking the beginning of a more somber chapter in my story. After my encounter in Gaza, news of my presence reached the Gazites, who, resentful, plotted an ambush. They surrounded the place and patiently waited throughout the night, conspiring for my destruction at dawn. However, my actions defied their expectations. Seizing the moment, I remained at rest until midnight. When darkness prevailed, I rose with supernatural strength. My hands grasped the city gates, clutching the sturdy posts and the solid security bar. With determination I bore this formidable weight on my shoulders, ascending to the top of the hill that stood majestically in front of Hebron. The feat of carrying the heavy gates, which should have been an insurmountable obstacle to the top of the hill, became a vivid expression of my astonishing strength. It was a reminder that, even in my moments of imprudence, the Lord still granted me extraordinary strength. This act, though impressive, foreshadowed future events that would change my life forever. The imposing gates I faced were not simple barriers, they were structures designed to allow the passage of chariots through crucial fortifications. The need to be wide enough to accommodate strategic chariots was evident. These gates, consisting of a pair of robust double leaves, went beyond common functionality. The mastery in their design sought to prevent easy access to potential adversaries, each gate was meticulously composed of heavy boards, strategically arranged. To ensure a solid defence, the boards were torn on one side and held by a vigorous horizontal beam, sliding skillfully through ingeniously located slots in the gateposts. Strength and security were paramount. Furthermore, to guarantee additional protection, the gates were reinforced with wooden posts. These posts had the peculiarity of pivoting in stone sockets, adding an extra layer of strength to the structure. The gates of Gaza, which I had to pull from their sockets and lift over my shoulders, were colossi of impressive weight, estimated at least 400 or 500 pounds, equivalent to approximately 200 kilograms. In my challenge, the magnitude of this burden symbolized not only the physical strength required, but also the tenacity and determination necessary to overcome seemingly insurmountable obstacles. In my frail humanity, despite facing previous lessons, I succumbed once again to temptation and my pride veiled my choices, leading me down a perilous path. On one of my journeys, I encountered Delilah, whose beauty could captivate even the most unyielding souls. Her cunning wrapped around me and blinded by my desires, I surrendered. I found myself once again in love, but this time with a woman entirely wrong for me. Despite my desire to be an instrument of God, I succumbed to the deceitful trap of sin. In my attempt to outwardly maintain the appearance of a Nazarite, I zealously kept the external features of my vow while shamelessly falling into the snare of immorality with a prostitute. I acknowledge the human tendency to compartmentalize our lives, believing that there are aspects that matter to God and others that do not. This dangerous game of duplicity is the path many choose when sin deceives us. However, the consequences of my imprudent choices were about to manifest once again. Once more, I found myself in Philistine territory, 
and their leaders were eager to extinguish the flame of rebellion burning in my heart. The Philistine rulers saw the perfect opportunity to capture me and set a plan in motion. They approached Delilah, who, though deeply in love, had a misguided love for money. The Philistine leaders offered her a hundred pieces of silver, a considerable sum that the temptation of luxury and wealth could not resist, more than a hundred and forty pounds or sixty-three kilo of silver. Delilah, seduced by the offer, approached me and posed the question that would change the course of my destiny. She inquired about the source of my strength and how she could securely bind me. In a moment of imprudence, I revealed my vulnerability. If I were tied with seven fresh undried cords, I would become as weak as any other. Naively, I acquiesced to her request, and she proceeded to bind me with those cords. Little did I know that Delilah had men hidden in one of the inner rooms of her house, ready to capture me as soon as she gave the signal. In a shrill cry, she announced my supposed capture. Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. However, I unraveled the cords with a strength that left those expecting my defeat astonished, breaking them as if they were threads burned by fire. The secret of my strength remained safe, but the machinery of my own destruction was already set in motion. After the initial betrayal, Delilah approached me again, expressing her dissatisfaction with my supposed mockery and deceit. Although I confirmed that I had indeed deceived her, it seemed that the lesson had not yet been engraved in my heart. Delilah, with her persistence, raised the question again that would lead my story to a dark conclusion. This time, she inquired about how she could securely bind me. Failing to learn from my past mistakes, I revealed another weakness. I stated that if I were bound with new ropes that had never been used before, I would lose my strength, becoming as vulnerable as any other. Unaware, I acceded to her request, allowing Delilah to take fresh ropes and tie me with the cunning plan of having men hidden in the inner room, ready to capture me at the opportune moment. The theatre repeated itself once more, when Delilah, with a voice laden with feigned distress, shouted, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. But once again, I broke the ropes from my arms with a strength that defied all explanation, thwarting the carefully devised plan. However, Delilah's frustration grew, and she accused me of mocking her and telling her lies. The cycle of deceit and liberation had become a dangerous game, and my disdain for warnings and the lessons of history only served to increase the imminent tragic outcome looming on the horizon of my life. Faced with Delilah's persistence and my apparent desire to please her, I shared another weakness that would prove to be my downfall. I explained that if she intertwined the seven locks of my hair in the fabric of her loom and fastened them with a pin, I would lose my strength becoming as weak as any other man. Yielding to misplaced trust, I allowed myself to be deceived once again. While I rested, Delilah seized the opportunity and intertwined the seven locks of my hair in the fabric, fastening them with the pin as I had instructed. Upon waking, I faced the reality of my betrayal to myself and my Nazarite vow. However, my strength had not completely vanished, and with a strong pull I removed the pin and tore my hair from the fabric. Delilah's reaction was swift. She shouted once again, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. But instead of fleeing, I confronted her indignation. She expressed her pain and distrust, questioning my love for not sharing my secrets with her. Her lament echoed day after day, becoming a constant torment. Finally, succumbing to the pressure and worn down by her complaints, I shared with her the true secret of my strength. My hair had never been cut, as I had been consecrated to God as a Nazirite from birth. The realization that I had finally told her the truth reflected in her eyes, thus sealing my fate. Faced with Delilah's betrayal and the loss of my supernatural strength, the Philistine leaders saw their opportunity and returned once again. In my apparent vulnerability, Delilah lulled me with my head in her lap and called a man to shave the seven locks of my hair, the symbol of my Nazirite vow and my connection to divine strength. As the blades cut my hair, weakness overcame me, and my strength gradually abandoned me. Delilah, realizing my vulnerability, shouted, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. Upon waking, I prepared to shake myself as on other occasions, but something was different. 
I didn't realize that the Lord had forsaken me. The connection that maintained my strength no longer existed. I had lived in complacency for so long that I mistakenly assumed nothing would change. In that moment, reality brutally set in. My strength vanished, and I found myself bound with chains, a once mighty man now reduced to powerlessness. I could only watch as my captors rejoiced in their triumph, and I, who had once been the champion of Israel, became a helpless captive. The irony of my destiny echoed, reminding me of the importance of humility and vigilance in one's life. The Philistines exacted their revenge by capturing me, and in an act of unimaginable cruelty, they gouged out my eyes. The world plunged into darkness for me, and the light of day faded away completely. The irony of my destiny echoed. First my sight led me to perdition by succumbing to visual temptations, and now I was deprived of vision forever. I was judged by the same weakness that had led me to Philistine enslavement. It is paradoxical that my blindness began in the prison. My eyes, instruments of disobedience, became my sentence. The unholy relationships my gaze triggered led me to this captivity. I had insisted on the freedom to do as I pleased, and paradoxically, I ended up with no freedom at all. Sin, with its sharp claws, collected its due, and my payday was cruel. I was found blind, chained, and enslaved in Gaza, where I was bound with bronze chains and condemned to grind grain in the prison. Now here I am, imprisoned and humiliated, but even in the depths of my despair, I find solace in the remnants of my faith. In the darkness of the dungeon, I lift my voice to the Lord God, seeking a final surge of strength to avenge my enemies. God gives me hope amid the shadows of my cell. As I pass my hand over my head, I feel my hair growing back, coarse but steadfast. This sign, though small, fills me with hope. I may not regain my eyes, but my hair, a symbol of my past strength, is growing again. My sin has transformed me into a miserable loser, but my growing hair signifies a new opportunity. I will be able to strike a blow for my people and for my God. Redemption looms, even if it is in the form of a few strands of hair emerging in the darkness of my blindness. While I remain in the darkness of my blindness, the Philistine leaders celebrate a grand festival in honor of their God, Dagon. The revelry echoes around me, as they offer sacrifices and praise Dagon's supposed victory over me, Samson. In their arrogance they proclaim, Our God has given us victory over our enemy. Dagon, also known as Denan, emerges as one of the oldest deities in Mesopotamia. The representation of Dagon is unique, half man, half fish, a mythical figure symbolizing the connection between the earthly and aquatic realms. This god, revered by the Philistines, is considered the supreme father of all other deities, a being revered in the region known as the Cradle of Civilization, the Fertile Crescent. The figure of Dagon stands as a symbol of power and protection for the Philistines, who believe that their god has delivered a divine victory over me. The festival overflows with exaltation, with rituals and ceremonies, intended to pay homage to the deity who supposedly granted them triumph over the famous Nazirite. In this moment of apparent Philistine triumph, physical blindness does not cloud my ability to perceive the irony of the situation. While they worship their god Dagon, the very god they believe responsible for my defeat, I feel an internal rebirth. My hair grows again, a tangible reminder that redemption and strength can emerge even in the deepest darkness. The plot of my story, marked by unexpected twists, now unfolds amidst Philistine celebrations and my tireless quest for purpose in this new phase of my life. The colossal statue of Dagon, an impressive figure merging the form of a man with fish-like features below the waist, stands as a giant in Philistine faith. Some representations describe him as a god of fish, a symbolic connection that makes sense given the Philistines' close relationship with the coast and maritime riches, this god becomes a central symbol in the Philistine pantheon. In my time, the Philistines continued to worship Dagon in temples scattered throughout Mesopotamia. Bet Dagon Gaza and Astod Hosed some of the most imposing temples, places where fervent worship and festivals were offered, 
in honor of this deity. Dagon, as a prominent figure, was not alone in Philistine worship. His son Baal was also an object of veneration in various forms throughout the land. The rituals dedicated to Dagon involved abundant offerings, where the Philistines presented gifts in recognition of their god's supposed victory over me, Samson. Participation in sacred festivals added an element of celebration to worship, creating an atmosphere of devotion and gratitude for the alleged triumphs bestowed by Dagon and Baal. Thus, while the Philistines celebrate their festival amid cheers and offerings, my blindness becomes an internal shadow that does not eclipse my determination. Although the Philistine gods are exalted, my internal rebirth, symbolized by the growth of my hair, urges me to keep hope alive amidst the darkness. In this duality of festivity and redemption, the plot of my story is composed of complex layers yet to be unveiled. The scene of my capture became a spectacle for Dagon's followers, who, seeing me deprived of my strength and blinded, proclaimed the victory of their God over the God of Israel. The news of my fall spread like wildfire, and people gathered to witness the outcome of Dagon's supposed superiority. When the spectators saw my helpless figure, they couldn't contain their joy. In their eyes, I, who had once defeated so many Philistines, was now a trophy confirming the supremacy of their maritime deity. Chants of praise to Dagon resonated amid the crowd, and the celebrations extended across Philistine cities, reinforcing their belief in the preeminence of their god. Dagon's followers, in their jubilation, didn't hesitate to proclaim their triumphant message to the surrounding land. In their version of events, they claimed that their god was undoubtedly more powerful than the god of Israel, as they had managed to conquer and subdue the one who had wreaked havoc among them in the past. This narrative became a powerful propaganda tool, solidifying faith in Dagon as an invincible god. The story of my downfall became a legend for the Philistines, reinforcing their belief in the efficacy of their cult and challenging the authority of the God of Israel. Meanwhile, in my confinement, I experienced the cruel irony of being a spectacle for those who rejoiced in my fall, unaware that in the shadows of my despair, my internal resilience was gaining strength. The plot of this narrative continues to weave itself, with unexpected twists and the promise of redemption hidden among the shadows. As I stood among the columns supporting the great Philistine temple, the excited crowd eagerly awaited the spectacle that was about to unfold. Although my physical strength had diminished, my heart still beat with a desire for redemption. In the midst of the mockery and revelry of the Philistines, I sought a moment of tranquility. Taking advantage of the presence of the young servant who guided me, I asked him to place my hands against the sturdy columns supporting the temple roof. I longed to rest for a moment and reflect on the chain of events that had brought me to this point. Through my mistakes and disobedience, I realized how my life had taken a course that led me to this imminent outcome. The crowd, oblivious to my thoughts and internal struggles, continued to laugh and mock, completely unaware of the silent strength that was gaining momentum within me. The columns against which I rested my hands seemed to symbolize the burden of my past choices and, at the same time, the only means for my possible redemption. As tension built in the air, I prepared for what would come next. Although my eyes could no longer see the daylight, my mind was illuminated by a spark of determination. The story of Samson was not coming to an end amid mocking laughter. Rather, it was about to reach its climax in a final act of sacrifice and redemption. Amid the columns, with the crowd watching expectantly, the curtain of my destiny was about to fall. The temple resonated with the clamor of the crowd, every corner filled with expectation and anticipation. My hands, pressed against the sturdy central columns, symbolized the direct connection to my imminent destiny. Despite my loss of physical strength, my prayer to the Lord God echoed within me, a plea for strength in this last act of my life. My heart pounded as I directed my thoughts to the Almighty. Lord, remember me once more, I cried out in the temple's dimness. I sought one last display of strength, a final opportunity to avenge the Philistines and redeem myself from past mistakes. My words resonated in the vastness of the temple, and at that moment, I felt a spiritual connection that transcended my physical blindness. 
with my hands pressing against the columns, I prepared for the final act. In that moment of communion with God, I sought supernatural strength, a last blow that would allow me to confront my enemies and, at the same time, purify my own being from the sins that had darkened my life. The room was filled with Philistine leaders and observers on the roof. However, in my inner world, everything boiled down to that prayer and the strength I sought from the Creator. Although my eyes no longer saw the light of day, my soul burned with the determination to fulfill my destiny. My words echoed in the temple, allow me to die with the Philistines. It was the end of the road for me, but also the rebirth of my purpose. In the act of sacrifice, I sought redemption, and finally, to fulfill the mission for which I was designated since my mysterious birth. With hands firmly pressed against the columns, I awaited the last chapter of Samson's story. My tale, marked by heroic feats and extraordinary exploits, stands as a vibrant warning. It whispers in our ears that strength, both physical and spiritual, is a precious gift that must be handled with caution and adorned with humility as its faithful companion. It points an accusing finger at the seductive allure of temptation and at the same time casts shadows over the inevitable consequences that accompany surrendering to selfish desires. However, my story also emits an echo of redemption, a melody that resonates even in the darkest abyss of the fall, because despite my mistakes and weaknesses, I found the strength needed to rise, to triumph, and ultimately, to fulfill the predestined plot of my destiny. My name is Samson, and this is the chronicle of my life, a narrative that at its core is proof that hope and redemption can flourish even in the most inhospitable terrain. Every page of my story narrates the constant struggle between virtue and temptation, light and darkness. The lessons engraved in my existence are beacons that illuminate the path for those who venture down similar roads. May my story serve as a perennial reminder that, even when we fall, we can rise, regain strength, and ultimately weave a tapestry of redemption that shines with the light of a second chance. My story is the crossroads of humanity, a tale that resonates with the universality of the struggles and triumphs of the human soul.